I'm going to talk today about understanding aggression and self-injury. I have no relationships with commercial interests. I want to give everyone a group hug because this talk is about sensitive topics and regardless of who you are and if you experience meltdowns or if you're a parent or professional who supports people who go through meltdowns, uh, it's hard on everybody and we need it to treat each other gently. This talk is not about premeditated violence or about um, uh, intentional harm. And if you need help for those types of situations, here are some resources for you. So in people with cognitive or communication differences, illness presents as a change in behavior or function, a change in behavior or function. Communication is the key to success in understanding what behavior might mean, what uh, a change in behavior or function might mean. So it's important to support people's access to communication and all people communicate. I used to teach that all behavior is communication, but I don't teach that anymore because I've learned that sometimes behavior is not purposeful or intended, it's um, automatic. Uh, it's your limbic system firing um, faster than your than your um, your super ego can uh, pull it back, or it's uh, obsessive behaviors that that you don't really control. So not all behavior is um, is communication. So challenging behavior, um, challenging behavior. I I I use that term uh, uh, somewhat cautiously because it's not a patient complaint. Patients don't come to me and say, I have challenging behavior, doctor, can you help me? It's, it's a caregiver complaint. So, um, so when, when someone comes to me and says someone has challenging behavior or a, a problem behavior, the first question that I ask is, who is challenged and why? because sometimes it's not a change in behavior or function of the individual, but it's a change in the caregiver's ability to cope. Uh, so for example, things were going fine, but now I have back pain and I can't lift them anymore, or I can't go on the long walks we used to go for, and now they're getting agitated because uh, because they're not getting enough exercise or they're not getting changed quickly enough and I need you and, and, and it's stressing us all out and it's causing behavior, but it's really more about the caregiver needing more support, needing to be relieved of some of their caregiver responsibilities um, or, or needing uh, a different type, type of help. So it's important that we're treating the right patient, that we're, that uh, that if the caregivers are the people who need help, that we provide them the help we need um, and that we distinguish that from a change in behavior of our patient or client. So when if we determine that it's the caregiver who, who needs the intervention, then, um, then we should try to do an assessment. Is there been a change in their resilience or their coping? Maybe they have new responsibilities to take care of other family members or they have their own health problems. Um, maybe they have been spending so much time on caregiving, they're not pursuing their own interests and dreams and maximizing their own potential and that's making them feel bitter. Um, maybe they need more social support. Maybe they need respite. Um, we have good data that shows that for every dollar we spend on respite care, it saves two dollars in um, in hospital care. Uh, so it actually keeps people out of the hospital to provide caregivers respite. Maybe they need training or maybe they need to, new equipment. We were able to lift our child, but now they're an adult and they're a lot heavier and we need uh, adaptive equipment so that we can continue to provide care without injuring ourselves. I wanna say a little bit about the difference between a meltdown and a tantrum. So, a meltdown is when someone is overwhelmed, that 
it's a reactive mechanism that um, that is not um, that is not about getting what you want. It's not about social manipulation. It's not about um, uh, trying to get something that you want. So when someone's having a tantrum, they're very clued into the people around them. They're trying to get them to do something. So, you know, I'm going to cry and scream until you give me ice cream or until you give me the gum I want or something like that. And once it becomes clear that I'm not going to get the gum or the ice cream, once those boundaries are set, I'm going to stop crying because there's no there's no point to it. So that's a tantrum. That's trying to um, that's trying to ha um, ha have an an outburst with the intention of trying to get somebody to do something. Um, and you can tell someone's doing a tantrum if they're checking in with the people around them about the engagement. Um, their protective mechanisms are intact, so they're, they're not going to run out into the middle of the street. They're not going to run into something or injure themselves um, because they're not aware of their surroundings. They're very much aware. They're very much aware of their surroundings and are trying to manipulate them, whereas in a meltdown, safety may be compromised because people may be um, unaware of the car that's about to hit them or about other dangers in their environment because they're just overwhelmed and shut down. Um, and if somebody's in a meltdown, then you need to keep them safe. You need to keep enough distance so that you don't, uh, if, if they're not in good control of their body, you don't um, get hit or scratched or, or bitten. Um, and but it's it's not goal dependent. So having a conversation with the person, trying to negotiate with them, it's not going to work. You just need to wait it out. So with with problem behavior, there's the old model, the old way of thinking. The old way of thinking is that the problem is the person. This is this is um, that because the problem is the person because of their autism, because of their disability, because of their mental health issues. Um, and we need to change or fix the person. Perhaps we need to remove them from society. We need to take control, maybe conserve them. Uh, we may need to physically or mechanically restrain them or restrain them with medications, um, seclusion or aversive treatments, which means like punishments of, of various sorts or, um, or psychological surgery uh, was used in the past um, based on this idea that, that the, the problem with problem behavior was, was something that was inherent in the individual. But the new model is to understand behavior as, as a trauma-informed uh, process, so it has much to do with someone's environment and their circumstances as it does with them as a person. Um, we can take a trauma-informed approach, what happened to you, not what's wrong with you. We, our approach is very much to look at a person's life circumstances and try to change it for the better and not to try to manage behavior in the context of a lifestyle that's unacceptable to them. And things that we can work on are skill development, giving people a better way to get their needs met, give them better communication skills, give them more interesting things to do. Um, giving people more knowledge and information so they have less fear, uh, full inclusion, full and active inclusion can help people to improve their behavior because it's very motivating because they want they uh, because they want to participate and so um, and if the behavior gets in the way that they'll start to moderate themselves and self-determination and supported decision making when people have choice and control over their lives they're much more likely to um the, the any any problem behaviors are much more likely to reduce themselves if we improve people's quality of life we improve their environments then the behaviors go down we don't need to fix them we need to fix uh the, their their circumstances So what about health as a reason why people have aggression or self-injury or other problem behaviors? 
Well, what we know about people with developmental disabilities is about a third have sensory processing differences or sensory differences. Most have multiple chronic medical conditions co-occurring with their disability. Many have seizure disorders. About a third have a diagnosable psychiatric disability in addition to their developmental disability. And if we just made a wild guess and you just told me that someone has um, a, a problem behavior, most of the time medical medical problems are either causing or contributing to the behavior so if i just took a wild guess and you said oh somebody has a, a new a new behavior and i said i think it's a medical problem most of the time i'm going to be right um and an, uh, another thing to be aware of is that um problem behavior is very common and it doesn't last forever um, that's an important thing to remind clients of because it, in the moment, it doesn't feel that way. In the moment, it feels like um, this, this is my new normal. It's intolerable. I can't, I can't deal with this. I, um, I, uh, um, and, and it, it feels, it feels very um, catastrophic and long-term. But most problem behavior, whether you figure it out or not, does resolve itself eventually. Um, so it's important to have that perspective. So what can you do to manage a behavioral crisis? What do you do in the moment? Um, this is this, the scared method I got from a, a little very simple well-written book called Managing Meltdowns by Deborah Lipsky. And the scared method is to de-escalate. So it is to provide safety. So if someone is in an environment where they may get injured or where, the, or where they may injure someone else, um, remove them from that situation, remain very calm, um, yourself. So it, when when other people are getting agitated, it's easy for us to get agitated ourselves, but we really need to go to our calm place and take care of ourselves enough as caregivers and have enough self insight to know when we're getting agitated because the people around us are agitated so that we can be a very safe, calm present next to somebody who is who is getting agitated or who's upset or who's anxious. Provide affirmation, um, not criticism. Criticism is often what comes to us, fear, criticism, but affirmation is what's helpful. Um, get people into their routines. So if people have routines, um, stim toys, things that they like, um, relying on our routines in times of chaos or times when our bodies aren't feeling good can really help us to, to get re-regulated. Empathy and developing an intervention plan. So af after the crisis, then what were the triggers? What, what made it go on longer than it needed to go on? and what can we do in the future? I wanna give you an example of a meltdown plan that was written by a self-advocate. Respect me when I have a meltdown. I have meltdowns periodically. Don't overreact. I will pull myself together faster if you have patience in the moment, not hard words. Not nice to make me feel bad about it, only touch me if I have said you are someone who can. Respect my space in the moment. My not saying it is caused by certain words is that it will happen anyhow. I have trauma from being underestimated, so I melt down often because of my trauma. It's not your fault. So I mentioned that problem behaviors or changes in behavior or function 
um, aggression or self-injury is frequently due to medical problems. Um, but those medical problems are not necessarily easy to, uh, to sort out when you are, um, when someone can't tell you what's going on with their internal experiences. So I have this mnemonic that I got from a um, colleague, uh, Dr. Zelinsky, may he rest in power, um, uh, who, who worked with many people uh, over many years as a psychiatrist. And, um, and I found that this framework has been extremely helpful. So it's the Hertz mnemonic. And things that are difficult to recognize are things that don't show external signs or symptoms. So something like migraines or headaches can be very difficult to, um, to identify because there's no test you can do or, um, or symptom that you see like a rash. Um, changes in hearing or vision. You would think that it would be easy to identify hearing and vision problems, but actually caregivers are not very good at recognizing hearing and vision differences in people with disabilities. So you have to actually um, test for it. Uh, dental problems. We often think about medical, but forget about the mouth and dental problems are common in our population and can cause pain and distress um, or other unrecognized injuries, even broken bones. I've had patients who have had serious injuries like broken bones. And it's if somebody doesn't come to you and say, uh, and, and say, I fell in, think my ankle's broken, it's actually a lot harder than you think to recognize uh, even something like a broken bone. Um, and so think, um, and you and traumatic brain injuries, traumatic head injuries um, can happen frequently. Um, urinary tract infections, so kidney stones um, or other kinds of stones like uh, gallstones can be difficult to recognize. Infections are very common, urinary tract infections, and often if the only symptom is it's burning, um, when, you, when you pee, then you might think, then it might be causing a lot of distress for the person, but it may not be easy for a caregiver to recognize until they have fever or start vomiting or have a more advanced infection. Um, urinary obstruction, so not being able to pee, um, is also common in people with disabilities and needs to be monitored. Uh, reflux, which is like heartburn, uh, the acid from the stomach going up the wrong direction can be very uncomfortable. I had a friend whose who's autistic son was de developed insomnia um, and was very agitated at night. And was keeping the whole family up and it was getting so bad. He was so agitated and the family was so sleep deprived. They were actually thinking of out of home placement for their for their son, even though that wasn't what they wanted, but they just weren't able to manage anymore. And so when I was thinking, well, he, he didn't have these behaviors before. This is a change in behavior function. And so let's just start going down this, this mnemonic. And I started thinking head, urinary tract, reflux, well, insomnia, when, when you lay down, heartburn tends to get worse because gravity doesn't help keep the acid down. It, it tends to flow up. So um, hmm, why don't you just try some over-the-counter heartburn medicine and see what happens? And they did. And sure enough, within a couple of days, something that had been going on for months and causing great distress was completely resolved. And they went back to being a happy family. Um, so the, this, this process is, is powerful. Other gastrointestinal problems like constipation um, can, can happen frequently in our population. Um, thyroid problems, uh, trauma or injuries that um, may not be recognized. Uh, seizures and people with developmental disabilities sometimes have the less common seizure types like absence seizures where people just um, look like they're not paying attention, that they maybe stare off into space and maybe it might be thought of as 
um, being non-compliant or not paying attention or something like that, but they're really having a seizure or sometimes a seizure could be suddenly laughing or crying out of seemingly nowhere. Um, so, so some seizure types can be um, harder to recognize if they don't look, uh, if, if they aren't the more common seizure types. Um, and then side effects of medications are really, really common and something you should always think about in the differential um, of any problem behavior, any aggression, or um, any, any uh, self-injury. Medical problems are common, but they aren't the only problems. Um, the only things that behavior can signal, behaviors can signal abuse, and sometimes it's even unintentional or well-meaning, but someone is doing something that the other person doesn't appreciate, um, even without intending uh, to do so. It can be escape or avoidance of demands, so trying to get out of something, and I know if I, if I do this behavior, then I'm not going to have to go out somewhere I don't want to go out or see someone I don't want to see uh, or do something I don't want to do. It could be a way of entertaining oneself, of getting attention. If someone is is bored, um, we all know that sometimes negative attention is better than no attention. Um, it could be a means of accessing a preferred activity or objects. If every time I have a tantrum, I get what I want, then I'm probably going to have more tantrums. Um, it can be a need for social attention. Um, it could be a manifestation of a psychiatric disability that hasn't been diagnosed or is, that, is not uh, well treated, like depression or anxiety. It could be a psychosocial stressor. So that means, you know, some, something in their life is, is not going well for them. Um, they're having a fight with friends or family, or uh, they need more, more social interactions or um, a caregiver that they really value has less time for them or other kinds of stressors. Someone in their life is sick who they depend on. Um, sometimes you don't, always recognize how um, how that impacts the people that we care for, the people in our lives, and how important those relationships are to them. It could be a pursuit of power and control um, uh, by, you know, uh, it's, it's a crude way to get power and control to be aggressive, but it works sometimes. Um, and if people don't have other ways to gain power and control, that's, that might be the way that they're doing that. Um, it could be a way of reducing arousal or anxiety of getting the wiggles out. It could be sensory sensitivities. I saw a lot of this during COVID where um, people either had new sensitivities because perhaps something like a parent was home and they had the computer on all the time and the, the fan of the computer was very bothersome to them or there was just a lot more noise and activity in the house and they got overwhelmed from it or some of their coping mechanisms to deal with sensory sensitivities like going on long walks or getting good exercise weren't available to them. So I had a lot more um, difficulties with sensory sensitivities when people were cooped up together during COVID. And there, there is substance abuse and substance use disorder in our community too. So that's always something to think about. So in terms of looking for clues about where the problem might be coming from, illness presents as a change in behavior or function. And so think about what has changed. Has their ability to communicate changed? their activity level, their behavior, are they confused? Um, has their diet changed, their mood, their movements, their sensitivities to sound or light or touch, their skills, their strength, their steadiness or energy, their skin, their sleep, their urine or stool, their vital signs. Um, if, you, if you can, try to identify what exactly has changed, it might give you clues as to what might be going on. And the process of doing this, um, 
the process of uh, trying to sort things out can very much help people get off of their natural tendency to try to um, to to try to focus on getting the behavior to stop as opposed to figuring out why the behavior is happening. So when people come to me, by the time people come to a doctor or to a professional to get help with problem behavior, they're usually at their wit's end. They're usually distressed and they often are very focused and often for very good reason on wanting to get the behavior to stop. And when I, as a professional, try to slow them down and think about why is this happening, they're often not appreciative of that conversation. <laughs> they're often saying, um, they're, they're often saying, why do we have to have this conversation at all? Because I just need a pill or I just need you to make it stop um, you, uh, because this is uh, dangerous for us. This is destroying our family relationships. This is putting them in danger. This is putting us in danger and, and we just need to get it to stop. But if you don't understand why something is happening, you're not going to come up with the right solution. And this process of using the Hertz mnemonic of systematically going through the possibilities of interviewing the caregivers and the patient, because sometimes we skip that part where we just, we don't ask them, why are you doing this? And, and if we just ask them, they might tell us in, uh, in, in behavior or, or in words. And, um, and uh, if, if we skip that step, sometimes we miss the, the easiest, most obvious, clue, but it's it's critically important to go through this process of trying to analyze why the behavior is happening in order to solve it. So I will leave you there and, um, and thank you so much. Mm -hmm.